Great. Well, why don't we get started? Most of us are here. A few more will join us uh, momentarily. Welcome everyone to our ongoing virtual book signing 2.0 series. And on behalf of everyone at the Hotchkiss Library of Sharon, I'm very pleased to welcome you. We're so happy to have you all here this evening. I'm Gretchen Hockmeister, the executive director of the library. Before we get started, I'll just reiterate um, that you're muted during the presentation. And if you'd like to ask a question after the um, first half hour, which will be um, a moderated discussion, you can ask your questions one of two ways, either by typing them in the chat box, which you can access at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then you can type your question in and we will read them for Chris to answer. Or you may open the participants box also um, from the bottom of the Zoom window and then click the raise hand feature and then we will call on you and unmute you and you'll be able to ask your question directly. Um, again, speaker view is a good way to enjoy the program and um, please feel free to keep your camera on. Um, after the discussion, again, we'll have questions and uh, don't wanna to forget to mention, we do have copies of the Spy Masters available to purchase at the library. Some of you have already ordered them. We will be contacting you tomorrow about how to pick them up. And you can also email or call us tomorrow. We have some more copies available for you and they each come with a signed book plate um, for you. So um, without further ado, um, let me just say we're pleased to have Chris here with us. He was with us in person for his last book, The Gatekeepers at our in-person book signing. And we're happy to have him here with this book. And I hope if there are any books in the future, we'll uh, I'll be able to gather in person at the library to discuss that one, which would be wonderful. So it's very, very happy to introduce our board member and esteemed investigative reporter, Brian Ross. And he is going to introduce Chris Whipple. Thank you, Gretchen. And before we start with Chris, let me thank you and Holly Nelson and the great team at the Hodgkins Library of Sharon for keeping the institution running during this COVID-19 we're at almost full power and it's really great. And I'm very honored and thrilled to be here tonight to talk with a, a former colleague of mine at ABC News, the award-winning producer at 60 Minutes and at Prime Time, and now the author of two fantastic books. Uh, this is a fantastic book, Chris Whipple. Thank you so much for joining us. I thought I knew a lot about the intelligence world, having read all the books that come out and, and covered much of it myself, but you have such fascinating anecdotes and stories here. How'd you do it? Brian, thanks. First of all, just such a pleasure to be uh, to be with you again. And uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Um, it began as a film with the great uh, filmmakers Jules and Gideon Naudet, who are famous for their 9-11 documentary, and my friend Susan Zarinsky, who is now president of CBS News. But we did a film for Showtime back in 2015 and I thought it barely scratched the surface of this unbelievable untold story of 17 men and one woman who uh, have run the world's most powerful intelligence agency since, in, in, this, in my case, in the, in the case of the Spy Masters, I go back to Dick Helms in the mid 60s. And uh, it's just a cast of characters that uh, Le Carre couldn't have dreamed up, uh, beginning with Helms who you know, dry martini in one hand and cigarette in the other who could walk into the Oval Office and tell LBJ that he was losing the Vietnam War. Uh, LBJ didn't want to hear it. Uh, all the way up to Gina Haspel, the current director, first woman, mystery woman who uh, came up as a covert operative and uh, it is running the agency today. So I, I was lucky with that cast of characters for sure. And so many agreed to talk to you. Uh, you know, these are spies that keep their uh, distance from reporters, uh, but you won them over. Well, it's a war of attrition, you know, <laughs> one director at a time. And of course, with the gatekeepers, uh, you'd, you'd begin when you'd get somebody like uh, Cheney on, under, under your belt. And then next thing you know, you've got Rumsfeld on board and it kind of worked the same way. They talk among themselves. And so, so one director would say to the other, George Tennant would call up and say, who's this guy Whipple? And they'd say, well, he's harmless. And, you know, the questions, <laughs> the questions were fair. Uh, there were no gotchas. And, and so it helped having done the gatekeepers because I could say to George Tennant, who hardly ever gives interviews, as you know, 
uh, I could say to tenant, well, call training, see what he says. Um, so yeah. I, I, I had a little bit of a track record. You've got great uh, individual stories. Uh, you talked with Mrs. Helms. Uh, you reveal how uh, the Petraeus bananas became a big issue, which I thought was a, a, a riot. Okay, for those who haven't read the book, uh, the bananas episode was one of those, it, it led to one of those phone calls that every reporter hates to make at, as you're finishing a book. And just because it was slightly embarrassing, I had to call David Petraeus and tell him, get him to confirm or deny that on his first day as CIA director, he became the laughingstock of Langley uh, because word spread that he had demanded that his bananas be sliced in just such a way that they had not been sliced that morning, evidently. Uh, <clears throat> well, one CIA wag described this as four-star general disease. Uh, it was a clash of culture for sure. Petraeus was accustomed to having a staff of, a personal staff of 50 people when he was running CENTCOM. Uh, and um, this was a whole new world at Langley. And you don't stand around waiting for people to put your coat on for you. Uh, <clears throat> and this had to be explained to Petraeus and it took him a while. He had by all accounts become a pretty good director, effective director before he, uh, his untimely demise, um, sharing classified information with his mistress. But um, that was an easier question to ask him than having to call <laughs> him up and confirm or deny the banana story, which he denied. He claims that he eats his bananas whole. Uh, right. Well, let's start. Uh, you start at the beginning. Let's start at the end. And let's talk about the current director of the CIA, Gina <laughs> Aspel. What do you make of her? You're quite critical in the end here about her. Well, she is a fascinating character to me, a mystery woman who flies under the radar, has given two, has given no interviews, uh, has given two boilerplate speeches since she became CIA director. Uh, she cut her teeth as a covert operative in the back alleys of Africa, uh, recruiting hard targets, and by all accounts was very good at it. I tell the story uh, the, of, of this unlikely mentor she found at CIA, of all people, Jose Rodriguez, who was the architect of the enhanced interrogation, the infamous enhanced interrogation program and the whole network of black sites. Well, it was Rodriguez who sent Gina Haspel to the Thailand base where Abu Zubaydah, among other Al-Qaeda terrorists, were subjected to those techniques, which almost uh, derailed her confirmation. Um, <clears throat> so it's a fascinating story uh, about how he became this unlikely feminist mentor to, to Gina Haspel, who was obviously ambitious, but also a little reticent um, and um, maybe sold herself a little bit short. She, was, she told Rodriguez that she was going to aim for being CIA station chief in Geneva. And Re Rodriguez said, Geneva? That's not good enough for you, girl. You've got to go to London. And the rest is history. She went to London, did two tours as CIA station chief. And that was the stepping stone to becoming deputy Pompeo and then CIA director. So the history is fascinating with her. And even more interesting is her relationship with Donald Trump, which I think is a complicated, fascinating relationship. And, and I, was, I was fascinated by the Axios story recently that said that she's on the execution list, quote mm -hmm. unquote, that she's going to be fired by Trump because Trump and the inner circle hate her. And I'm not so sure that's, I think it's more complicated than that. I think that Trump, first of all, she learned how to, she has a, had, she developed a rapport with Trump early on by all accounts. I mean, this is someone who, whose whole training was in recruiting Russian assets. <laughs> good at it. Uh, I think she was good at uh, telling Trump what he wanted to hear. I think he loved the fact that she, she had been involved in the torture program at CIA. Trump loved that. Uh, 
what he doesn't love, what he hates, evidently, is that she, she has not gone along with his campaign to just declassify everything willy-nilly so that he can go after his political enemies like John Brennan. So she's not been cooperative in that. Uh, he has a sycophant in the form of John Ratcliffe as director of national intelligence. She's been somewhat less of a sycophant, but by all accounts, he loves the fact that she's good at killing terrorists, as one top White House official told me. Uh, she loves killing terrorists, and she's really good at it. You liken her in the last uh, two paragraphs to uh, someone says she could be a good as a prison camp commandant. Well, that was somebody who felt that when push came to shove, that she would not be, she would not have the backbone to stand up to Trump. That was somebody, a uh, very form, former, a very high ranking uh, CIA official who knows her, who felt that despite her, rep, her very strong reputation in the field as a covert operative, uh, <clears throat> that she wouldn't be able to stand up to him. And there were people, certainly people who felt that uh, she should have pushed back when Jose Rodriguez, her boss, uh, ordered her to destroy the so-called torture tapes the, the, the videotapes of enhanced interrogation in Thailand, she eagerly complied and gave the instructions to do so. So there are people who feel that she will take orders from the president, even when they're improper. You make the book, uh, I think, an overarching theme, uh, quoting someone to say, in Washington, there are either policy successes or intelligence failures. We know a lot about the failures of the CIA but you give some good ideas about what's going on where they have been successful. How do you rate them overall? That's a, you know, it's a mixed bag. Uh, it's, it's a mixed record. I'm, I'm not quite as, uh, as, as dark and as bleak as uh, Tim Weiner on Legacy of Ashes. Uh, his argument essentially is that they've really done almost nothing right. Um, I think that's unfair. I think that at the end of the day, the you remember some of some of you who are who may be old enough to remember uh, the late Frank Church, who back in the 70s uh, described the CIA as a rogue elephant that careening around the world doing all kinds of improper things. It's never been a rogue elephant when the CIA has done has screwed up and it's screwed up big time over the years. Uh, on many occasions, it's usually at the direction of the President of the United States. Uh, <clears throat> and just to give you one example, a story that I tell in the book, <clears throat> excuse me, arguably the biggest intelligence failure in CIA history was their failure to anticipate the fall of the Shah of Iran. It was just, they were blind. They were asleep at the switch. Uh, Stansfield Turner, Jimmy Carter, CIA director admitted, and he admitted to me, I did the last interview with him before he died uh, some, some years ago, admitted that we were just, we fell asleep. Well, the truth is that that was a huge CIA screw up for sure, but Henry Kissinger had struck a deal with the Shah of Iran and the deal, and, and, and which was never public. And the deal was, we will not, make contact with any of your political opponents. We won't talk that, we won't infiltrate them, we won't talk to them, we won't spy on them. Um, if you give us access to the listening posts, posts on the border with the Soviet Union, and if we have, you know, and oil was also, of course, a big part of that. Well, it was a deal that blinded the CIA. Uh, so I'm not giving them a, a, a pass on that, but policymakers are often involved when the CIA screws up. And we can talk about a couple of cases, dramatic cases, if you like, 9-11 uh, and COVID-19. Absolutely. And I also want to talk about the relationship now with uh, President Trump and the CIA. Even before uh, Gina came in there, he had uh, his current Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, and you uh, recount in there uh, a version I had not read fully about how they had to pull a key agent, an asset, out of the Kremlin for fear that perhaps 
the president <laughs> would reveal his identity wittingly or unwittingly. Tell us about that. <clears throat> well, I opened the book uh, with uh, a description of uh, John Brennan uh, burning the midnight oil out at Langley in his seventh floor conference room. And he's, it's, this is August of 2016. And it's just all the pieces are suddenly coming together. He, he realizes that the Russians have, are launching a, you know, an unprecedented assault on the 2016 election. It's coming. And not only is it coming, but we knew, the CIA knew from a human source that it was coming with, at the direction of Vladimir Putin himself. And this wasn't from so-called signals intelligence. This was from human intelligence uh, in the form of a CIA asset inside the Kremlin, somebody who was not close to Putin but had access to his office and who, who confirmed this. Well, fast forward now, some months later, when Trump um, walks into the Oval Office and, and jokes with with Lavrov, uh, the foreign minister, and with Kislyak, the ambassador, uh, about um, having just fired Jim Comey, that nutcase. Uh, and it was during that meeting <clears throat> that Trump uh, compromised some, this, this is a little bit complicated, but he, he compromised Israeli intelligence, um, a very sensitive operation in the Middle East. Uh, and <clears throat> so there was outrage over this after the fact. H.R. McMaster tried to deny it. Uh, but this led to real concern within the intelligence community that Trump just didn't care about protecting sources or method. He'd tell anybody anything, including the Russians. Uh, and so there, be, there was real concern about this Russian source in uh, this Russian asset in the Kremlin. Could Trump expose him or, and it's, and the, there are various reports on this. It's not clear that he was extricated because they thought Trump would compromise him, but that was one of the possibilities uh, that concerned the CIA and the intelligence community. And he was extradited. He's now in the US. Uh, he was in the Maryland area uh, living preposterously under his own name for a while. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not sure where he is at this point. We're talking with Chris Whipple, the author of this great new book, The Spy Masters, CIA, Dir CIA Directors Shape History and the Future. As you look back on the 17 or so that you analyzed, who do you think was the best director of the CIA? Well, let me answer in general and, and specifically. Um, in general, here's a spoiler alert for people who haven't read it. The, the, some of the attributes that make great White House chiefs of staff also serve CIA directors well. Um, it's no coincidence in my mind that Leon Panetta was the gold standard in both jobs. Uh, Jim Baker's, I'm one of those who cite Baker as perhaps the best White House chief, but Panetta was right up there and he was one of the best CIA directors because Panetta was grounded, he was comfortable in his own skin. He was, <clears throat> he had a good relationship with the president, but he wasn't too close to the president. He was independent, he knew Capitol Hill, he knew the White House. Panetta was a guy who could walk into the Oval Office and tell Barack Obama what he didn't wanna hear. That is something that White House chiefs and CIA directors, have, good ones, have to have. Um, so Panetta's right up there. I. And it didn't hurt that he had Osama bin Laden on his watch, um, obviously. Uh, Dick Helms is always cited as the quintessential so-called honest broker of intelligence uh, who would tell LBJ, who would give it to LBJ with the bark off. Uh, and uh, LBJ didn't necessarily like it, but he took it. Um, Bob Gates was another successful insider who rose up the ranks. Uh, I think uh, George H.W. Bush was the perfect outsider, the right guy at the right time to rescue the agency and its reputation after all the big scandals of the 70s. Um, so those are some of the good ones. 
and among them, not a single James Bond-like individual, is there? Well, you know, Gates actually described Dick Helms as a James as a James Bond-like individual, and he was to the extent that you know, again, he had that dry martini in one hand and cigarette in the other. He was he could hold his own on a dance floor with Fred Astaire, uh, which he did at a state dinner in 1975, literally. Uh, There's a great photo in the book, yes. Yeah, and uh, so this was a dinner for the Shah of Iran and uh, Fred, uh, Fred Astaire was dancing with the Shah Banu, the Empress. <clears throat> uh, Helms was dancing with his wife. He was, um, he was very smooth. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, so he'd be the closest. Yeah, if I can hold it up, you, there are great pictures in here, but you can see <laughs> the White House. The uh, CIA director is a big job. I take it if uh, President Trump is not reelected, uh, a new director will come. Who stands in line now to be a possible CIA director under uh, a Biden administration? Is it Mike Morrell got the lead there? Well, Morrell, Morrell's in the running. Um, I think that, um, you know, Morrell, you know, he's got, he's got a lot of friends and he has some detractors. He was a little bit, I think he'd be the first to admit that he was uh, politically not all that <clears throat> savvy in the last go around that he got a little bit far out on a limb. Um, I think a couple other names I've heard are Jeremy Bash, uh, who was Leon Panetta's chief of staff at the CIA, uh, who's brilliant. Um, I've even heard uh, Adam Schiff uh, as a name that's been bandied about. There, there are no lack of candidates out there. There, there are a whole bunch uh, in line who would be pretty good. And I think it's pretty clear that Haspel will be gone one way or the other. Even, even if Trump were to win, I think he would want, uh, I, I do think the ax will fall and I think he'll want a sycophant like John Ratcliffe, somebody who's even, who's less independent. And apparently no shortage of those candidates either, really. Apparently not. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get to all of your questions for our friends from the library. Send them in or hold up your hand and Gretchen will start taking track because you've got lots of questions for Chris. Let me ask you about just the process of writing this book. You know, uh, you know, you and I both worked in television news. This is a whole different kind of uh, beast, right? It is. And it's funny because uh, both books began as, as documentaries. And a friend of mine at the CIA said, has, has anybody told you you're, do, you're doing this backwards? Most people write books and then they turn them into films. Uh, in my case, they both started as documentaries and which is what, of course, what, what used to be my day job. Uh, and <clears throat> I found that, um, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't that hard to, uh, to, to, to learn a new skill set, to uh, flex a slightly different muscle, putting it on the page as opposed to uh, into a script for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> or for Diane. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a different, it's a different skill set to some extent, but the heart of it is the same. I mean, it's, it's just, yeah. it, the, the book is, my two books, of course, are, are heavily based on they're really much more based on interviews, in-depth interviews, getting to people other people haven't gotten to. Uh, and um, that's, that's something that television and uh, books have in common. When I wrote a book about Bernie Madoff, I found it to be very liberating to have the space and the time to go into some of the interesting uh, yeah. down the road off, off exactly topic that you can get to that makes it much more interesting, just like your banana stories with General Petraeus. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you're the only person who's asked me about the banana story, which I love. <laughs> it was my favorite thing in that chapter too. It was silly. It was a, a great story. Uh, and your book comes out in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, what's that like as an author to go against that? And in an election where all we're talking about is uh, Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Well, it's, it, it's tough. It's been a real challenge. The book was supposed to come out in the spring, uh, in May. And uh, I lobbied the publisher to put it off and the publisher agreed pretty quickly that uh, better this fall than in the uh, throes of the early pandemic. Uh, but still, it's been strange. Um, it's been, um, it's been all, almost all virtual, 99% virtual. I did one trip to, uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa, for people who really wanted to come out. So I, 
but it's mostly virtual and and I did sail right into this perfect storm of 24 seven election coverage uh, and 15 other huge political books, including Bob Woodward's that dropped at exactly the same time. So oh. it's, you know, it's a competitive, it's, it's competitive out there, but I'm, I'm not complaining. It's been a lot of fun. And what have you heard from uh, your sources who helped with the book and inside the agency out in Langley? Well, um, fortunately, they're still speaking to me, most of them. Um, and um, I, think, I think people have found it to be fair. Um, quite a few, as you, as you know from having read it, an awful, awful lot of them are on the record, which yep. is not uh, always the case with CIA books or Woodward books, speaking of Woodward. Um, <clears throat> and so some of them stuck their necks out. Uh, there's a guy named Richard Blee, who, who was the head of the Al-Qaeda unit pre-9-11, <clears throat> who went over and pounded his fist on the table with Kofor Black and tried to get Condi Rice to prepare for an imminent attack in July of 2001. And he was on the record about that for the first time in the book. I, I haven't spoken to him, but I understand he's, he's, he's pleased with it. Um, so it's been, it's been gratifying so far. Um, I wish that that Gina Haspel, I like to think I got close to getting Gina Haspel to talk to me, but no cigar. Uh, I, I, I regret that she and Pompeo uh, didn't sit down. I think they should have. Um, I think that CIA directors, a very important point that I try to make in the book is that the CIA director has to be the honest broker of intelligence, not only to the president, but to Congress and the American people. And the great ones weren't afraid to answer tough questions. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely true. Uh, Gretchen, you let me know when we've got some questions uh, from our uh, participants today with a discussion for Chris uh, Whipple. It's a, a fantastic book. I couldn't recommend it highly enough. Uh, you talked about the failures with the uh, inability to sort of predict the uh, uprising in Iran. How about the Bay of Pigs going back in history? Yeah, where I mean, the uh, CIA-led invasion of Cuba was a complete fiasco. Just a, just a horrible fiasco. Um, and, um, you know, it may well have been because uh, under Alan Dulles, uh, who was uh, famously Dwight Eisenhower's CIA director and uh, had the longest tenure of anybody, uh, the CIA was, was riding high and, um, you know, they... In, in their mind, they pulled off successful coups in, in Iran and Guatemala, and uh, it was hubris, and it was <clears throat> stupid. Um, and one of the great stories uh, I tell in the book is how Richard Helms, young Richard Helms, who was climbing the ladder, uh, but who was certainly would have been involved in the planning meetings, uh, never was because he never showed up for any of the planning meetings. He was, he was very good at avoiding, uh, he had very good political <laughs> antenna and he left no fingerprints where he didn't want them. And he managed to escape that. But right after the Bay of Pigs, John F. Kennedy famously said that he wanted to, to scatter the CIA to the winds. Uh, he was furious. And um, he fired Alan Dulles, the CIA director, John McCone came in, which was fortunate because McCone was very effective during the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think. Uh, but yeah, it was along with missing the Shah, the fall of the Shah, two of the biggest failures. Let's also add in there the failure to really detect what was going to happen uh, in 911. I mean, they had some leads that were following two hijackers who came to this country, and also the uh, position that the CIA sort of supported of. Uh, Weapons of mass destruction inside of Iraq. Weapons of mass destruction, without a doubt. But I, I would say when it comes to 9-11 that uh, the CIA gets a bad rap on this. This one's on the Bush White House, in my view. Uh, and I spell out in, in, in great yeah. detail the walk up to September 11th and all of the warnings that the CIA gave to the Bush White House. And, and all they had to do, all Condi Rice had to do was call a so-called principles meeting. Um, if you have a principles meeting and get the heads of CIA, FBI, 
uh, FAA, all these people are at a table and you shake the trees, stuff tends to fall out. I think there's a real good chance that they would have had to confront the fact that those two Al Qaeda hijackers were on US soil. They had been for months. Um, that's the kind of thing that usually rears its head when you take things seriously. Uh, but the Bush White House didn't for a lot of different reasons. Um, I'm sorry, the other part of your question was? Well, and also the, the failure to, to the, 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 you know, the curve, the curveball, the informant uh, who WMD suggested, was, yeah. Was a, an absolute, I mean, arguably worse than the Bay of Pigs. Um, and I, and I go into detail about it and I, and I think I'm pretty, it's, it's funny because I was lucky enough to be on the cover of the New York Times Book Review a couple of weeks ago. And the review said that I offered this damning portrait of George Tennant. And I thought to myself, really? I, I, thought I, was, I thought I was fair to George because the conventional wisdom about Tennant is that he quote unquote cooked the books, you know, under pressure from Cheney and, uh, and others. And I'm not, I don't think you can, I, I don't think there's a very strong case for that. I think you can make a stronger case that it was a terrible estimate of WMDs, it was wrong, uh, but the tenant believed it uh, at the time. Um, he would argue that every other intelligence service uh, in the world thought Saddam had WMDs too. Um, so I'm not giving him a pass, but there's no doubt that that had a huge effect on the reputation of the CIA. CIA has never recovered from it. Trump exploited it in 2016. Uh, it's a real black mark. Without a doubt. All right, Chris, we're getting questions uh, coming in from uh, people, good people of Sharon who are watching today. Uh, Gretchen, who's up? We have a question from Jürgen, and he's wondering how difficult is the fact-checking job when writing about a subject that deals with a lot of classified information? It's tough. It, 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 it's as tough as you, as you could imagine. And I have to, to make a shout out to, uh, to uh, um, Caroline Borgi, um, who did a, an amazing job, my researcher on the book, who, uh, who really knocked herself out trying to confirm things that nobody wanted to talk about. Um, and uh, of course, the archives are, <clears throat> You know, the, it are, are always a difficult proposition in navigating them and trying to try to get information. Um, one of the fascinating things, just a quick story about that, you go into a subject like this thinking naively that, all right, certain stuff is classified and the rest is fair game. And it's not nearly that simple. Uh, some directors it will talk about stuff they shouldn't talk about. Uh, other directors will, will not go even close to the line uh, and are very conservative. And the trick as a reporter is to figure out who's who um, and figure out who will really, you know, stretch the boundaries. Um, if, if you're, and, and a lot of it has to do with ego and personality and confidence. I think um, nobody's going to tell Bob Yates or Leon Panetta or George Tenet, what they can talk about and what they can't. Um, and other directors are much more timid. David Petraeus almost jumped out of the chair when I asked him about so-called signature strikes, which are lethal drone strikes on suspected terrorists whose names are not known, <clears throat> basically. And Mike Hayden sat there and talked to me about it all day. Uh, and because he felt it was out there and people should understand how those decisions were made. Gretchen, next question. Rhonda asks, uh, with all the new cyber capabilities, will real life spies, the so-called human assets of the CIA become outdated? I don't think so. And I think um, Brian asked me earlier about the, the human source uh, for the intelligence on the Russian assault in 2016, who was ultimately uh, extricated from, from Russia perfect example of how uh, human spies will always be necessary. Well, I think one of the lessons of 9-11 is that it was a failure to penetrate Al-Qaeda, was a failure to have somebody inside 
that organization. You could say the same thing about the, the Shah of Iran. We had no one inside the Ayatollah Khomeini's camp. Uh, it's, we have no one, to my knowledge, uh, inside the North Korean leadership. Uh, that's always been a problem. So I think that human spies are always going to make a big difference. Gretchen, what's next? We have a question from Joe. What happened with the failure to anticipate Crimea? You know, <clears throat> that's a good question. I think that, I think that again, what it comes down to is it's very hard to predict the behavior of foreign leaders, um, especially the so-called hard targets, uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans. Um, it's very hard to predict uh, what they're going to do. And yet CIA analysts are, uh, are charged with doing it. There's a one character in the book, marvelous uh, guy named Charlie Allen, who's now an octogenarian, retired from the CIA, but a marvelous storyteller. The steel trap mind remembers everything, total recall. <clears throat> he was the so-called national intelligence officer for warning. And I said to him, um, we were talking about, he was, he failed in his mind, he failed to issue a timely warning for the Yom Kippur War. Um, I said, That's, does that still bother you? He said, <laughs> it's killing me. He loses sleep over it to this day. Um, so it's very, it's very hard to predict the behavior of foreign leaders. These are great questions. What's next, Gretchen? Mark asks, at the time of the Church and Pike hearings, CIA Director William Colby sounded like a reformer. He seems forgotten today. Do you consider Colby a failure? Quite the opposite, actually. I, I think, I, I love Colby. I think he's a great, not only a great character, I mean, he's sort of the Michael Corleone of the CIA in, in a way, because he came in and he was, he wasn't aiming to be CIA director. He, his politics were, were quite liberal. He, uh, he was sort of like an ACLU lawyer. Right? He carried a copy of the constitution around in his pocket. He, and yet he was this stone cold uh, killer when he was in the OSS, dropping behind enemy lines in Norway and killing Nazis. Uh, the quietest guy in a room, uh, but a fascinating character. And he made this unbelievably difficult decision to release to the committees, the congressional committees, the so-called family jewels, which was the compendium of all these outrageous misdeeds and skullduggery and attempted assassination attempts, 693 pages of, of uh, sordid history. And he decided that the committee should have it because the only hope for the CIA at that moment, um, which, and they were in deep, deep trouble. Uh, the only hope was transparency. And it infuriated Cheney and the rest of the gang at the White House went bananas, um, but <clears throat> he did it. And I think as a result, we have congressional oversight and that's made all the difference. All right, that's great. Uh, Gretchen, what's up? Rhonda asks, is the Nixon era scandal using the CIA for political purposes and domestic spying by the president, are those years behind us? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> so uh, this is not the first time today with Donald Trump. It's obviously not the first time we've had a president who was convinced that the CIA was a deep state full of liberal enemies who were hell bent on bringing him down. That's what Nixon thought of the CIA and of Dick Helms. Um, Nixon was wrong. Trump is wrong. Um, you know, they're basically, the vast majority of, of them are people trying to do their jobs and trying to ignore the bluster coming out of the White House. Um, but Donald Trump, in my opinion, has succeeded in, 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 in politicizing the intelligence community in a way that would, would make Richard Nixon blush. Uh, 
you know, the way in which he has uh, eliminated um, objective, honest brokers, the way in which he has installed at the head of the community as the director of national intelligence, a sycophant, a uh, partisan zealot um, who has no trouble rubber stamping falsehoods by the president on a daily basis and who is clearly uh, essentially his henchman. So Nixon never succeeded in doing that. Uh, Richard Helms at the end of the day stood up to Nixon when Nixon tried to get him to participate in the Watergate cover-up. You write with some impact the uh, performance of President Trump in Helsinki after he met Putin uh, and the, re the shock of CIA insiders about what the president said about them. They were stunned. Uh, the people I talked to were stunned. And I noticed that in Woodward's book, uh, Woodward says that Dan Coates became convinced at, at that moment that there was some that, that Trump might be compromised. That's what I heard from very senior CIA officials that Helsinki was a, 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 a you know, a clarifying moment uh, in, a, in a very bad way. One uh, former high ranking official who ran Russian operations for years uh, told me that when he saw that performance, uh, when Trump, you know, acting like Putin's lapdog in that, it, it, that, he said, I could think of no other explanation other than uh, the Russians have something on him. Not necessarily compromise, but it could be financial relationship, something. You mentioned briefly before the notion of this deep state. Give us an idea what actually Trump thinks it is. What, what's going on in his head? Trump, you know, it, he famously compared the intelligence community to Nazi Germany um, in, in January of 2017. Part of that was, again, he, he, he had this visceral reaction to the Steele dossier. And then, of course, he accused the intelligence community of leaking the Steele dossier. Um, which accused him all, of all those sordid things. And so that was, that was part of it. But he came into office, he clearly he ran on the notion that um, these are the people who brought you uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Uh, he clearly saw the, saw the CIA and the intelligence community as a right target, a big fat target. But he appears to really have brought this visceral contempt for the community. The point where, as I wrote in the Washington Post a couple of months ago, I said, this president is unbriefable. You, you literally can't brief him because he, number one, doesn't uh, read the president's daily brief. Uh, number one. Uh, he, number two, he's incurious. Uh, he thinks he knows everything worth knowing. Uh, and, and on top of that, he brings this contempt for the intelligence community. I, I, I hesitate to play armchair psychologist, but it's there and it's, um, it's more visceral. All you had to do was watch, um, well, we've all watched him for almost four years. It's, it's visceral. You make a point though, that every president has his ways of receiving information. They made films for Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Uh, Somebody's figured out a way to brief uh, Donald Trump with something. Who who's doing it and how are they doing it? You think? Well, um, so yes and no. Uh, I wouldn't assume that they've figured out a way to brief him. No. They the I, I do have, as you know, Brian. I mean, I have a chapter, a whole chapter on uh, Pompeo and yeah, and Gina Haspel and Trump and and an epilogue about the COVID nineteen about the pandemic what Trump knew and when he knew it and what the intelligence community told him. Um, in that epilogue, I talk about the fact that in January, the critical moment, January of 2020, uh, his briefings had broken down almost completely to the point where they were lucky to brief him once a week. Now, at the time, it was a briefer named Beth Sanner, who's no longer there. She's, she, uh, the two primary briefers he's had over the years are, are, are gone now. Um, from what I hear, um, and I think this may be even be, well, uh, from what I hear, 
Uh, Radcliffe is the only guy he will listen to at this point. Is that uh, right? That's what I'm hearing. And, and of course, we know that Radcliffe is practiced at simply telling him what he wants to hear. And there's no falsehood Trump utters that Radcliffe won't believe and repeat and, and try to run down for him. Um, so it's a dangerous situation. Um, and in January, one of the things I report is that Beth Sanner, uh, Trump, in fact, said publicly that the first I'd ever heard of the coronavirus was on January 23. And my briefer told me it was, quote, no big deal, end quote. Well, I mean, my sources who know Beth Sanders say there's zero possibility that she ever said any such thing. Uh, and the PDB, so-called, is by definition a big deal. When you brief it on top of being in the PDB, it's an even bigger deal. So uh, none of that adds up. It really is the presidential daily brief. Uh, Gretchen, we've got time for a couple of more questions. Are there any more out there? Yeah, there I think we have four more questions. Okay, um, let's get to them all. From Ryan, how much influence does the director of the CIA, not DCI, really have the ability to shape the course of history? Or is it just left up to the president's agenda to determine how the US responds to major geopolitical events around the world? Well, I think both things are true. I mean, I do think that as the subhead of my subtitle of my book implies that CIA directors, it's really hard to overstate the importance of the position because the CIA director is the person we depend on to prevent another Pearl Harbor, 9-11, or even a lethal pandemic. Um, that's the person in the room under or ordinary circumstances, uh, who is on whose intelligence history changing decisions are made. Uh, in the case of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, John McCone, um, in the end, told Kennedy, you know, we recommended against invading Cuba. Uh, he had not only U2 photographs at hand, but he also had uh, uh, purloined manuals of Soviet missiles from a Soviet defector. Um, there have been uh, other cases where, you know, uh, George Tenet famously uh, did not stand up to Trump during that infamous slam dunk meeting, uh, when, in my opinion, he should have said to the president, Mr. President, um, boy, it's just a lousy case. Uh, so I do think these CIA directors can shape history uh, in that sense, for better or worse. Um, it is also true that, and it's a fascinating exercise, I mean, we could talk about it all day, but it's also true that it's, it's a real question as to how much intelligence really matters in, at the end of the day. Uh, would Bush have invaded Iraq anyway, regardless of what George Tenet told him or uh, what kind of estimate he got from the CIA? Um, we like to think, I'm a fan of George Packer's book about Dick Holbrook, who was my first boss right out of college. And Packer has this great description of how, um, you know, we, we like to think that a bunch of people in suits sitting around a sitting around a conference table, make brilliant decisions that shape the course of history, whereas in fact, they don't know what's going on. Um, so it's, you know, it's a fascinating discussion. All right, three more questions. Gretchen, what's next? All right, Layla asks, if the president can't be told the hard things during daily briefings, is there a way to bypass the Oval Office and present the daily briefing content to people who can hear it effectively? So luckily that's already the case. Uh, the president's daily brief, <coughs> generally speaking, and as far as I know, currently is distributed to top officials besides Trump. So the national security advisor, uh, the secretary of state, um, a number of cabinet officials, um, you, you know, they, they receive it, they're briefed on it and so the president is not the only customer. All right, Gretchen, what's next? 
Lisa asks, why do you think no one at the CIA would talk about General Soleimani Mungnaya? Everyone you asked shut you down and one, uh, we wonder what's behind that. I'm really gl glad you brought that up because I love that story about Umad Mungnaya. And it, because it's such, a, it's such a, a major untold story in the history of the CIA, I mean, he really was the most wanted uh, terrorist by both Mossad and CIA. Um, I tell the story of how, uh, and it's never been reported before, how they almost got him on Clinton's watch. Uh, they didn't get him until 2008 in Syria in a, in a, uh, a, a joint CIA-Mossad operation where CIA built the bomb and Mossad pulled the trigger. And <clears throat> anyway, um, the, uh, in my mind, um, that's a story that's, that's really important. And at one point, another story I tell about this, while they had Imad Magnia under surveillance before he was killed, somebody walked into the shot and they realized that it was General Soleimani, the Iranian general, who uh, wasn't killed until recently in January, 2020, as, as we all know. Well, um, they decided not to take the shot at that time. <clears throat> so he was, running around for another decade wreaking havoc. There's the whole question of assassination and lethal strikes is fraught. And it's to this day, it has not been resolved. There's an executive order known 12 triple three that goes all the way back to the Reagan years prohibiting the assassination of, uh, of officials. And there wasn't nearly enough discussion of that uh, when General Soleimani was killed in 2020 by a lethal drone authorized by Trump. Um, I think you can argue that you can argue that he should have been taken out, that he was a real enemy. But you can also argue that when you take out a, a leader of another country, uh, no matter how heinous, um, that you're drawing a target on the back of every other every American official as well. And I don't think that just went by in our news cycles. There wasn't any debate about it. And as you know, NBC News is reporting tonight that there are threats against key American military officials in this country, including one they thought was a close encounter in the last uh, month or so, uh, suspected uh, Iranian activist targeting uh, American generals, just as we did Suleimani. I have to say from one journalist to another, the fact that you could report where the bomb that took out McNair was made in North Carolina was astounding to me. I thought, <laughs> my goodness, how did he get that? <laughs> Good work. All right, Gretchen, one final question for Chris. Yes, the last question comes from Jurgen, and he asks, um, George Herbert Walker Bush was CIA director before becoming vice president and then president. Mm -hmm. That's an unusual career path. In your assessment, did this shape his view of the job as president? It absolutely did, <clears throat> uh, because when when George H. W. Bush became president, uh, he he loved his briefings. He loved to have them. He, he he insisted on having one every morning. Uh, he often liked to have the director himself do the briefing, but he had the briefings without fail, and uh, the intelligence community loved working with him because they really had an attentive customer which is the name of the game. At, at CIA, if you, a CIA director runs a, an army of analysts, um, covert operatives, lethal drones, all kinds of stuff. But if you don't have the ear of the president, the whole enterprise is for naught. <clears throat> and George H.W. Bush was the most attentive customer they ever had. The, the one of the great, uh, might have been in history is uh, George H.W. Bush, when he was CIA director, wanted to stay on as Jimmy Carter's CIA director. Imagine if that had happened. He never would have been president, and neither would George W. Amazing. Well, Chris Whipple, I want to thank you so much for joining us this evening as we have an after dinner a drink or a glass of wine or a good uh, cup of coffee. Thank you so much. This book is absolutely fantastic. I cannot recommend it highly enough. And it's a uh, page turner. It really is fascinating to read. It's so well written, so clean. Chris, thanks so much. Always good to see you. And Gretchen, I'll turn it back to you. Brian, thank you, everyone.
Thank you, Chris, so much. And thank you, Brian, for moderating this evening. What a great discussion. I definitely am going to get a couple of these as Christmas gifts. So uh, yeah. if anybody needs to do that, uh, contact us tomorrow with the library by phone or email, and we'll set you up with a book. So thanks again so much. It was really wonderful. And um, we thank you all for your support of the library and stay safe and well. Good night. Thank you so Good night. much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. Hey, Brian, my pleasure. Great you bet. See. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> thank you so much, all of you. I appreciate it. It's great.